The Western Conference is projected to be a dogfight from seeds 1 through 10, but one team may be situated to rise above the mess. Find out who as the 2024 Locked On NBA season previews continue right now. This is Locked On Podcast Network's 2024 NBA season preview. Your team every day. And welcome back to the 2024 Locked On NBA Season Previews. This episode, we are focused on the teams predicted by our friends at FanDuel to land in the middle of the Western Conference, fighting for the bottom four playoff seeds. Today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you will get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. I'm Andy Kamenetsky, host of Locked On Lakers, and I will be your host for this preview. Joining me are my... Colleagues from the Locked On Podcast Network, including Matt George of Locked On Kings, Michael Cole of Locked On Grizzlies, Charlie Walter of Locked On Warriors, and the diva Jake Madison of Locked On Pelicans, who cannot be here for the roundtable, but joins us remotely and selfishly with his own videos. Uh, we begin, gentlemen, with the first question. We'll just kind of bounce around with thoughts. I'm going to begin with Matt. Which of these teams has the best chance to break into the top four of the West? Well, uh, because of the, the, the homerism, the, the purple tinted glasses, I do think it's the Sacramento Kings for the, in the standpoint of just the offensive firepower that they have. And they got there before two seasons ago just on the backs of the offense, and their offense, I think, has improved from even that year where they were number one in the NBA. The Sacramento Kings have kind of gotten back to their priorities, which is uh, offensively driven, offensively gifted. The The... The reality of the situation, though, is you can make a good case for every single one of these teams. And honestly, I think the top four versus number five probably will be like half a game. <laughs> so so in reality, it's going to be a dog fight through and through. And, and, and there might be a it might honestly come down to like the Kings and, and, and Grizzlies. Let's say the, the, the Kings split the series with the Grizzlies, but the Grizzlies get it on a tiebreaker or whatever. And that that'll be the difference between maybe not just one spot it could be a couple of spots based on how tight this conference is, but I'll, I'll say the Sacramento Kings from the standpoint of offensively, I think they're in it. They've set themselves up in a position where if they stay healthy, I think they're, they're near unstoppable uh, defensively still massive question marks, but we've seen them get there before because of the offense and they're expecting and, and looking to do it again. Yeah. I, I, I feel like um, the Kings, I, that defensive question, especially when you move in DeMar DeRozan for like a Harrison Barnes and just really, quintupling down on the things you do really well. I need to see how it's all going to look if they're going to stop anybody. DeMichael, you represent the team that is most closely linked to a top four seed, but it's been a minute since they were there. A lot that's happened since then. How do you think you guys could bounce back? Uh, I think, I mean, they have a decent shot at it because simply from the standpoint of, again, you go two years ago, 50-plus win team, number two seed in the West. The year after that, 50-plus wins, number two seed in the West. Uh, last season, 33 players play, you know, a season I've never seen before, you know, injury-wise and whatnot. But uh, so if you just look at it from, you know, just what the roster has, you know, with John Morant, with Desmond Bain, with Jaron Jackson Jr., with Zach Eady stepping in for Steven Adams, with, you know, Dylan Brooks uh, being gone now, and you have Marcus Smart, and putting that group together, uh, you have what is on paper a roster that is comparable, or some would say is even better than those two teams that won 50-plus games, especially from a depth standpoint. I think the big loss is Tyus Jones. They still haven't replaced him. But uh, you have Luke Kennard, you have Gigi Jackson, you have Vince Williams Jr. They've developed all these players uh, internally. So uh, I think the Grizzlies have a really good shot uh, because, uh, quite frankly, their style of play is built for the regular season, which is why, you know, they've had some uh, struggles in the playoffs at time. The way that they play defense, uh, they're going to be top five, top ten in defense all, all the time. That's that's just – that's their calling card. You know, Taylor Jenkins now – uh, has Zach Eady kind of to deploy alongside of Jaron Jackson Jr. They're going to be strong defensively. Uh, it's kind of the opposite with the Kings. You know, and, and with the Kings, it's the defensive question. With the Grizzlies, it's the offense. But I will say this. Uh, there is, in Memphis, there is an urgency to get this thing right on the offensive end. And at some point, you know, uh, it, it's going to strike for them. They they have a lot of talent. But what, they, what they're trying to do now is continue to emphasize pace, 
uh, a lot more movement and cutting within the offense. I was talking to one of the players the other day, Santi Aldama, basically was saying, you know, in the past, you know, we were just sitting in the corners a little bit more stagnant. Now we're moving more off the ball. It's more cutting off the ball, which is going to take eyes off of John Morant, which is going to help the Grizzlies offense uh, flow a little bit better. They don't have to be a top five offense by any means necessary. If the Grizzlies are uh, in the top third of the league, I say top 13, top 14 offense with uh, what's going to be a top 10 defense, then I think you make a strong case for them uh, being that top four uh, team in the West. Yeah, Charlie, I think actually if you went around the league uh, polling pundits, they would probably say of any of these teams, the Grizzlies would have the best shot just because of the recent pedigree. And John Moran is, one when healthy, one of the best players in the league. Do you consider them, though, a lock to make it back in the top four? A lock by no means. I don't think any of these teams are a lock, but there are some X factors there with one, Gigi Jackson. I know he's out for a while, metatarsal. I had the fifth metatarsal injury, uh, was able to actually hobble down the uh, the aisle to uh, my, my wedding, essentially. Um, and that was mm. that was a month. Quite then. a gamer, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, and then by two months in, I was able to play basketball again, not at the level that Gigi Jackson would be looking to. But you got to look at that as a piece that at some point this year can come back, help you. Bane Jackson, uh, John ja Morant, uh, enough said there. And then Zach Eady is, is kind of my X factor if he is ready to play at this level consistently because he kind of gives Ja that out. Uh, I know Ja has some of the best body control in the league, so good with balance, but the times he does get off balance, Zach's just that, you know, hey, I'm in the air. I, I got to go somewhere with it. Oh, let's find the seven foot four guy to uh, bail me out of some trouble here. So I, I like that addition. As far as the Kings, defense is the question. Perimeter defense did not look great against the Warriors considering they made 28 threes in Golden One Center, a franchise record. Um, so that's got to that's gonna scare you a little bit. I, I know. DeMar Get him out of the way during perfect. preseason. Get him out okay. of the way during preseason. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> so we'll see, man. Yeah, you know it's funny. I actually feel like, and Matt to Michael, you guys can uh, weigh in as well. But yeah. other than maybe OKC, I'm not sure you can make an argument for a lock, like a stone cold lock, for any team in the West, just because it's going to be. So incredibly stacked. Minnesota, we don't know what it looks like now mm -hmm. after the uh, cat trade with Denver. They have become extremely top-heavy, and Jamal Murray's been looking hobbled. Uh, Dallas, it was a very small sample size, and they're going to lose some defense, bringing in some offense with Clay. but it's a different look. Like, How fluid do you just think things are going to be in general, regardless of who the top four seeds actually are? It's super wide open. I, I mean, here's how I've broken it down, Andy, uh, with the way that I'm looking at this season in the West, because you you legitimately, like, you could give me eight to nine different teams and I could make an argument, oh, that team could be top four. But what it's going to come down to, in my opinion, I've, I've kind of bottled it down to two factors. It's going to be injuries and it's going to be continuity. I think those are going to be separators. And we kind of saw that a little bit uh, last season as well. I pointed to the Timberwolves and the Mavs uh, from the continuity standpoint, because if you go the year before, uh, there was talks about already uh, splitting up Rudy Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns because the first year was like, eh, this, this ain't going to work. And then, you know, the next year, come back and they go to the Western Conference Finals, have a good, you know, had a really good season. And then same thing with Kyrie and, and Luca. The, the first year they were together after the trade deadline, people were like, uh, mm, I don't know about this duo. And then, boom, they go to the finals of the next year. So you build up on that continuity. That's why the Grizzlies, you know, uh, with the John Morant, Desmond Bain, Jaron Jackson Jr. with that core uh, and – you know, continuity is going to be on the Lakers side, you know, a little bit there. The Warriors, they got a bunch of new pieces. Uh, the Kings are going to, you know, figure in DeMar DeRozan. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how that works out. But uh, that's one. And then injuries. Like, it, it, at the end of the day, Oklahoma City, what, what they had going for them mostly last season was they were the healthiest team. They were the healthiest team. And the Grizzlies, what they didn't have <laughs> going for them is they were the unhealthiest team. Well, the golden boy, Jake Madison, has demanded that he weigh in on this. So here's what he has to say. Jake Madison here from the Locked On Pelicans podcast. I think when you look at all of these teams, Memphis likely has the best case for jumping into the top four in the Western Conference. But I don't think it's a lock by any stretch. John Morant missed a lot of time. And while it seemingly has his head right when it comes to everything, 
you know, that is still a little bit TBD and that's a lot of time to miss. There's going to be some rust and some chemistry that needs to be rebuilt. They've also dealt with a lot of injuries and that's a big concern for me going forward. And their big off season acquisition, in my opinion, was very big drafting Zach Eady. They definitely needed a center. I do think Edie is going to succeed at the NBA level, but is he more of an elite backup? Is he a starter? They're going to be putting a lot of pressure and a big usage rate on him. Does he fit their style? He's slower. You know, he plays with his back to the basket. Is that conducive to the modern NBA? And I'm not so sure. So while, yes, the Grizzlies were there a couple of seasons ago, John Morant is back and hopefully healthy this year. There's still big questions around that team that make me wonder just exactly what their ceiling is going to be. You ask me this in another year, it might be a different story, but there's still a little bit in prove-it mode to me going into this season. Yeah, and the last thing I would add is just that if there's any team in the league that has a player who may feel like he owes it more to his team to kick ass and -hmm. make up for some lost time, much of which Mm -hmm. he caused – it would be John Morant, so that might be something that works in the Grizzlies' favor. Coming up next, has the title window closed for the Lakers and the Warriors? It's the 2024 Locked On NBA Season Preview next. The Locked On NBA Season Preview is brought to you by FanDuel. NFL fans, you can enjoy the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So let's just say you're watching a game and – you feel like you've got a hunch for how everything is going to go. You can predict every touchdown pass, every turnover, every sack. Just It's like you are calling the plays before it happened. You can confirm those hunches with the latest stats, live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you would place your bets. And you can get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Plus, we are getting closer to the 2024-25 NBA season. Our friends at FanDuel have options for you, as of this recording, the, the Thunder are three to one favorites to win the West, followed by the Wolves, Mavs, and Nuggets, all tied at five to one. And then with the teams wrapped here, Grizzlies are sixteen to one, Lakers nineteen to one, the Warriors twenty one to one, and the Pelicans and Kings tied at twenty two to one. That's FanDuel.com. The 2024 Locked On NBA season previews continue. As a reminder, you can get daily coverage of all your favorite NBA teams by subscribing to the Locked On podcast. And we also have the NBA covered nationally with Locked On NBA, NBA Big Board, and Locked On Fantasy Basketball. We move on to the next question. Is the Lakers title window closed? What about the Warriors? I will begin as the Lakers voice I'll be honest, I don't think either window is super wide. And as Locked On Lakers every dayers, We'll know, I've said many times, the window for the LeBron and AD era may have shut the moment the Russell Westbrook trade happened, a move that the franchise is still recovering from and trying to correct. I think the Lakers are an unusual team with both a high ceiling and a low floor, depending on injuries and you know other factors like that. You, they can be very good. They could be pretty ordinary. I think overall they're going to be good, not great. That being said, I feel like the Lakers' title window is wider, however narrow, but still wider than the Warriors, if for no other reason than they have two superstar-level players and the Warriors have just one, so pure upside. And based on the reports and comments I'm seeing from Warriors training camp, it doesn't feel to me like they've actually bought into their prospects this season. They feel more unsettled to me, but Charlie, feel free to disagree. I'm going to disagree with you. One, you say one superstar. Is Draymond Green chopped liver? I mean, superstar. He's not a superstar. He's he's, he's he's not a superstar. Stop. (laughs) He's not a superstar, dude. He's an important player to a championship team. All-star. Yeah. He's a great player. He's a great player. But let me put it this way. He's the nuclei. If if Steph goes out, if Steph gets hurt, how far can Draymond carry? Draymond quits, too. Yeah, no, he's not taking over. I, I get what yeah, you're his, saying. His, his back starts hurting. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's, a, he's a very important piece. But the podcast get team. insane <laughs> at that point because he's got he's got nothing to lose. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, did hit two threes the other day, but not a sharpshooter by any means. But when you look at the Warriors, the reason Better I would say himself. that I think they have a higher ceiling this season is that optionality that we've heard a lot. Andy, it feels like, correct me if I'm wrong, feels like the Lakers are somewhat stuck. They are who they are at this point. You're expecting them to be pretty much the same team 
come March, the, the Lakers' best chances of being a lot better than a season ago is internal development and then just health because the Lakers had so many injuries last year that you can point to for some of their struggles last season. Warriors, on the other hand, like they have enough tradable assets to cobble things together, draft picks as well, to where anyone that goes on the market, they can flirt with. So you can surround a, a Steph Curry, a Draymond Green, potentially keep Andrew Wiggins if he gets back to 21-22 form. Um, and you could keep those guys. You could keep a, a Buddy Heel as a shooter and DeAnthony Melton, who looks really good. And you can add in one of the best players in the world, potentially, if that player becomes available. Now, we've seen what they've done in the offseason. Uh, apparently, both those Paul George and uh, Lowry Markkinen courtings were not as not as uh, real as maybe they were made out to be. And the players that were on the block were not as, you know, actually on the block as it was made out to be. So I think they're kind of riding with what they have. We'll see. I don't believe that this team is championship caliber with what they have on October 10th. But, uh, I mean, a lot can change, and they've talked about it. They're, they're willing to, you know, shift some of their assets and some of their future to win right now in this three-year window. Matt, you're unbiased in the sense that you likely hate both of these teams. So <laughs> how do you feel about their title window prospects? And, and Shut? Barely open? Wide open? I mean, I don't think it's I, – I think you could say that their title, title windows and I think the title windows of all four teams are marginally the same. Like, mm -hmm. if, if anyone has an advantage, I guess it's it's Memphis, but they have a lot of – I'm not sold by Zach plugging all of a sudden, plugging Zach Eady in as a rookie, mm -hmm. seven-foot-four guy who has to fit into this is all of a sudden just going to – They're a very top-heavy team, too. Steven right? Adams was so essential to the success of that team, and Zach yeah. Eady's not just going to replace Steven Adams. But we haven't seen the Grizzlies for a while, so and I love Marcus Smart. I'm a huge fan of Marcus Smart, and I don't, I'm looking forward to seeing – not against my team, but I'm looking forward to seeing what, how different uh, he can be and what he can provide for the Memphis Grizzlies. That being said, like I'm not going to sit here and say the Sacramento Kings have a bigger title window than than any team in here because the Kings still have to prove it. I think what the Lakers have over any other team is the Lakers have names and the Warriors. If the Warriors are going to win another title, it's gonna it, it would make Steph Curry immortal. Like it would put Steph Curry into just god status as he if he was able to carry this roster. Jonathan Kaminga looked really good in Sacramento, I thought, and I think the Warriors are banking heavily on Kaminga to take a significant jump this year, which could happen. But if you're putting all your eggs in that basket, you're setting yourself up for failure. I think Draymond Green is is close to washed. He does what he does really, really well, but Draymond Green is more likely going to get himself in trouble and get himself suspended. And if Steph Curry goes down by any means, I think the Warriors are one of the worst teams in the Western Conference, period. And that's just because of how essential Steph is to that team. But injuries could destroy any one of these four. The Kings mm -hmm. lose to Montes Sabonis. Even with Fox and DeRozan here, the Kings lose Sabonis, they lose their identity, they lose their foundation. So you can make that argument for everybody. I'm, I'm not hating on anybody's title chances. I think all four of these teams have to prove something. I just think it would be a miracle if any one of these four really makes a, a deep, deep run. We're talking past Western Conference Finals, which DeMar DeRozan predicted the Kings would make a Western Conference run, Finals run. I'll, I'll, I'd like to buy into his optimism. <laughs> DeMichael, of all the hosts here, you are most recently familiar with the concept of seasons from hell. Um, two in a row, <laughs> actually. Like you, you really are the best person to speak on this next question. Which team in this group? And remember, the Pelicans are here, even if Jake Madison's too good to join us. Mm -hmm. Which of these teams do you feel like is most uh, potentially set up for a season from hell? Man, uh, and it's probably the Lakers. It, 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 it's probably the Lakers simply because. Uh, LeBron, LeBron is so good, but LeBron is 39. And, um, you know, we know he takes very good care of his body. But, you know, I like to break these teams down from the standpoint. Like, okay, what would this team look like without this player, without that player, without that player? Uh, I think Golden State is probably a close second for me because right now it's constructed. You know, it's going to be Steph Curry kind of, you know, uh, doing a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, but with the Lakers – there are a lot of unanswered questions from the standpoint of, you know, uh, the, the depth here, uh, the roles that certain guys are going to be playing. Uh, it's far all the way down to the starting lineup. And uh, I, I think I just 
Like, when I think of the Lakers right now, I think they'll be solid defensively. That's what I think. Really? Uh, you may I, be the I, only one. I, I think they will. No, no, I, I think they'll be solid defensively. We'll no, I mean it. You really may be the only one. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> you, don't, you don't think they'll be solid defensively? I need to see that. Too, yeah, but yeah. I mean, if they are solid defensively, Anthony Davis deserves to win defensive player he, of, the, he would be of the, the millennium. Coming up, which of these teams can change what we think about this season by making a big trade? It's the 2024 Locked On NBA season preview. Continuing next. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by Game Time, the best concert I've ever seen in my life. George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic in 1992, the Palladium in Hollywood. They played for five hours. I'm not exaggerating, without a break. And I have been chasing concerts ever since they could top that one. I've seen a few that have come close. Prince at the Forum, Neil Young at the Greek, a different George Clinton concert at the House of Blues. And as I keep that search going, I will always be using Game Time because they make it easier. You can actually look forward to finding tickets with features like Game Time Picks that filters out all the confusing, flowery verbiage and shows you just incredible deals on great seats and they save you time. And they offer stuff like panoramic seat views before you buy so you know exactly what the view to the stage is going to be like. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code LOCKDOWNNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code L O C K E D O. And NBA for twenty dollars off. The Locked On NBA season preview continues. A reminder: you can get daily coverage of your favorite NBA team by subscribing to their Locked On podcast. We also have the NBA covered nationally with Locked On NBA, NBA Big Board, and Locked On Fantasy Basketball. So, gentlemen, which of these teams still need to make a trade? for this season to get better. Matt, we begin with you. I mean, a, a big like theme of this season for the Sacramento Kings for me is what the Kings, th there's a major question the Kings need to have an answered either by the trade deadline or by next offseason. And that's, do you feel comfortable going all in with this group? Because you don't have time to waste, right? Do you feel comfortable? You have a, a payday for Keegan Murray coming up. De'Aaron Fox is potentially going to be eligible for a super max. Demonis Sabonis just started his $40 plus million dollar contract. DeMar DeRozan's only getting older, right? Like, do you feel comfortable going all in or do you not? And if the answer is yes to that question, then the Kings will try and make a big move at the deadline or at the latest next offseason to try and really put themselves in a championship conversation. Not saying they become a favorite by any means, depending upon how this season goes. So trades will always be a topic of conversation in Sacramento. The Kings will be paying very close attention to which disgruntled star becomes available and if it makes sense, they have assets. They have control over uh, a, a bunch of their draft picks. They have pieces like Kevin Herter that they're not afraid to move on from if they need to. They have young players that they can add in to sweeten the deal. And it hurts my heart to even say it because I'm a Keegan Murray guy through and through. And this organization loves Keegan Murray. But Keegan is the guy that every single team is asking for in a trade. And if mm. the star makes enough sense... And the Kings mm. really feel like they can they can capitalize for a champion, try and make a championship push. I could see Keegan potential. The, the Kings would have to get a cannot refuse offer, or just feel so confident in a move that they would mo move on from Keegan Murray. But if that's the trigger that they need to pull to build a legitimate title contender, big four at the trade deadline, I think they would strongly consider it if the if the cards stack up the right way. The situation, by the way, you're laying out there, Matt. Uh, the same could be said for the Lakers and Austin Reeves. Um, who they've been extremely reluctant. They've been treating him as essentially untouchable adjacent in some reported offers. For example, if they had been more willing, DeJounte Murray might have ended up a Laker as opposed to a Pelican. Mm -hmm. If if uh, Rob Palenka had been willing to include Austin Reeves in a deal for DeJounte. Speaking of the Pelicans, uh, the guy who's too good for the rest of us, Jake Madison, wanted to weigh in on this as well. Jake Madison here from the Locked On Pelicans podcast. I think there's two teams that still need to make a trade if they want to move up in the standings. You could argue that the Pelicans are one of them. They have a glaring hole at center. Reports just came out that Herb Jones is going to be starting at the five for New Orleans. Is that the right move? I'm not sure. They've tried to trade Brandon Ingram to balance their roster out a little bit more, but you don't need to hear me talk about the Pelicans. I think 
the bigger team that really needs to make a move is the Golden State Warriors. This is a team that in preseason looks like Steph Curry and a bunch of role players. And Steph Curry maybe can get you to the play-in tournament and maybe out of the play-in tournament, but that doesn't scream that their title window is open at all anymore when it comes to that. It feels like it is really, really shut to the point that you heard Steph Curry recently say, like, we need a, maybe to have a new identity and we've got to play a different way. This this isn't the Warriors of old, and whatever kind of magic they had seems like it maybe has left with Clay Thompson symbolically leaving them in, like physically leaving them too. So that's not a great position for them to be in. They des- definitely need to make another move to bring in a more superstar level player to keep this title window window open. You gonna sit back and take that, Charlie? No, I'm absolutely not. Um, <laughs> disrespectful to Jonathan Kaminga to to say role player. I, I mean, superstar is is debatable. Will he ever be? Well, that's Draymond. We've already established. Yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> Draymond just he gets disrespected, and I understand why. I mean, his game is he can't make a layup. I mean, if he could make a layup, he'd be a Hall of Famer. Or I mean, there are plenty of superstars who can't, though. To be fair, I mean, it's that four foot runner. He he can't make it whatsoever. But he's glue, man. And and ball knowers know. And I know you guys are ball knowers. He helps the team win. I don't know how he would be on like the Pistons if he would improve that ceiling. But in Golden State system, like he's he's massive. He helps out. Um, some other guys. I mean, Pajemski. I don't think Pajemski's like a. Uh, Jake uses the word superstar, and I know we we love using that word all the time because in the last what 15 years, almost every team has had a pair, sometimes a trio of superstars that that you know hoist a trophy. With that being said, Bajemski's just a um, connector. That's the word that Kerr's using, but he's someone that just every time he touches the ball, seems like he makes the right play, doesn't make too many bad ones, finds open guys around the perimeter that can knock it down, and with the Warriors' ball movement and bringing in Terry Stotts. And having shooters like Melton, Heald, Pajemski, Curry, they can all flirt with 40%. If you get someone like Kaminga and Wiggins that can knock down 36 37%, Draymond isn't the, the worst shooter you know in the world like he's been uh, many times in his career. You get those things all connecting at once, and I don't think they're a, uh, a terrible team by any means. I just don't think that they have championship-level ceiling, and that's where I look at them as someone that can uh, definitely – benefit from the trade but it's it's wait wait and see mode right now uh with pajemski melton and healed and then moody potentially fighting for shooting guard spots i mean if pods isn't your guy and maybe you even see him as a point guard the, the point guard position clogged a little bit right now would anyone else look at him as maybe a starting point guard in this league and then you package him together with a kaminga or with a draft pick and what would that kind of return you? That's what I'm looking at. The The only way the Warriors can be super successful this season is if the young guys ball out. And that may mean that they're not even on the team at the end of the year. They just improve their stock so much to the point where the Warriors were able to flip some of their young assets and get some players that were in their mid-20s instead of their early 20s. But D'Anthony Melton's going to be an X-Factor too because he's someone that's 26 years of age. You know about him, DeMichael. He's a good player that they could extend long-term and put him in that shooting guard position, and then it gives them flexibility with guys like Moody and uh, Brandon Bajemski and potentially packaging them together. Man, yeah, I'm, I'm still getting used to this. De'Anthony Melton, Kyle Anderson on the Warriors. Like, this is this is, this is is weird. But, uh, but but yeah, I think that's that's the easy, trendy pick here, right, is, is, is Golden State. It, I think it's that way because if you look, you know, with the Lakers, you got LeBron and AD. You look at – you know, the Kings, you got, you know, Sabonis, you got De'Aaron Fox, DeMar DeRozan, same thing with the Pels, you know, all the star power they have over there in the Grizzlies, you know, core. Uh, but the Warriors, it's 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 a little bit different. Like, I, I mean, I don't think Jake was too far off. Like, they like a treasure's chest of role players over there. Like, they just, It's a just... shopping cart, man. They got a shopping <laughs> cart roster, literally, with a bunch <laughs> of players in there that, that could be on the move at some point. So I don't know how they cobble together. I agree with that. Yeah. But it, it's sometimes considered the good problem to have, right? Having a bunch of players that can uh, be valuable in a lot of different spots. Yeah, it's a bunch of players that could be the missing piece or a, a critical piece to a, a different team or even, you know, uh, to their team. Like the Anthony Melt, you know, people in Memphis really miss him. Uh, and Kyle Anderson has always been viewed as like kind of that winning type of player, nothing flashy, you know, all that type of stuff. So uh, I think Golden State is the easy pick here because – the, the, the big thing with them to me is, you know, uh, teams are going to look at the roster and they're going to say, 
you know, um, you know, we got to stop Steph Curry, you know, uh, by by any means necessary or attempt to. You know, it's it's easier said than done. We we know how well you know Golden State, uh, you know, likes to move Curry around and all these things. But that's going to be the goal of opponents. And who is that other guy? That's going to say, okay, I can I can go for thirty this game. I could go for thirty. I think that was a big problem for them last season. I mean, it, it took a while uh, throughout the season for another player on the team to you know score twenty five points. So uh, that's kind of the big question that I have. Sure, you got a bunch of guys that can you know score ten to fifteen a night, but Steph Curry is the only player I'm looking at on that roster, and I'm saying, oh yeah, you you can go to the bank with him scoring twenty. You know. Uh, it, pretty much each and every night, you know, minus some off nights. So uh, that's the team I'm looking at. They need to still make that big swing, whereas these other rosters, you know, you could pretty much make a case that they just have to stay healthy and, you know, some little schematical stuff and whatnot, and they'll be right there. But there's right, a big. Di- I was just going to jump in really quick and and just say this: there's a big difference between making a trade out of desperation and making a trade to improve your roster. And I think this, the Warriors are putting themselves in a position where they might have to make a desperate trade, which <laughs> could could lead to finally pulling the trigger on something and taking a big risk and it paying off tremendously, or it could lead to you hamstringing your franchise. And as soon as Steph Curry retires, now you're you have no assets or anything, and now you're really really starting from ground zero. Yeah, I mean. It- we were talking before about the Austin Reeves and the Keegan Murray. I, I know that stuff's going on with pods as well. The idea of other teams wanted him. Warriors not willing to pull the trigger. We'll see how that impacts any or all of these teams. Speaking of any or all of these teams, we are going to conclude this show with a note of positivity. Each of us is going to say one nice thing about one other team in this group. Charlie, you start. I'm going to say a nice thing about every team. How about that? And it's going to take five seconds because I'm not going to go the 45 minutes like the last guy did. But uh, the Michael and the Grizzlies, Ja Moran is awesome. He's a special player. Uh, Matt, I love De'Aaron Fox. He's a lot of fun. Andy, LeBron James is pretty good at basketball. And Jake, Zion Williamson's one of my favorite players in the league. So this is a player-driven sport. Those are a lot of fun players to watch. The teams? Nah. <laughs> to Michael. I like DeMontis Sabonis now. Shout out to the, uh, Netflix and the starting five. I, I, the, the guy's grown on to me, you know. About he, he time. He, he's grown on to me. And now you kind of feel bad because, you know, I had a ballot last year. And I'm like, man, I didn't vote him as an all-star. You know, you, you, you see how he reacted to it. I'm like, oh, my bad. You know, I find myself, I'm watching it. I'm, I'm apologizing. But the guy's grown on to me. I'm, I'm a DeMontis Sabonis fan now. Good. Matt. Then the Netflix documentary series is doing its job because a lot of people should be changing their tune about Domas because they have no idea what they're talking about when talking about him. Uh, the nice thing that I'll say, uh, and I've been dodging tomatoes all episode. Uh, Andy, you know this. I'm sure as hell not going to say anything nice about the Lakers. Uh, but the nice have it thing, any other way. Warrior fans, uh, I, I've, I've had a fun back and forth with them. One, I love that NorCal basketball is good. And the fact that the Kings and Warriors have been good at the same time has been very, very fun. And I'll I'll say this too, and I've gotten in trouble with Kings fans saying this before too. I adore Steph Curry. I do. Like any opportunity I get to watch Steph Curry play, I will take that opportunity and run with it. It sucks when you're on the wrong end of him putting up 50 to knock you out of the playoffs a couple years ago. But Steph Curry is unbelievable watching what he did in the Olympics. Incredible. Uh, So anytime I get to watch Steph Curry play, I'm terrified because he's usually killing the Kings in some capacity. But from a, like, I was here, I got to watch and cover most of this man's career. Steph Curry is uh, is on the Mount Rushmore and and pretty much, he's he might be at the top of the GOAT list or getting very close in my mind. For me, I'm going to say about the Pelicans, I mentioned before that they have the prospect of the weird season. I always find them just a fascinatingly weird team <laughs> on the court. They have a weird <laughs> roster. Zion is one of the weirdest stars to try to figure out who he is in the league. Their ownership situation is weird. The market itself is weird for an NBA franchise that hasn't quite figured out how to cement itself into the culture. They even have a mascot that is both delightful and totally inappropriate for easily scared small children. That The mascot is presumably there to amuse in the first place they're just an incredibly weird team and i love them for that sincerely thanks again to matt george from locked on kings to michael cole from locked on grizzlies charlie walter 
from Locked on Kings and Jake Madison from Locked on Pelicans, whose ego was so big he would not join us in person. Thank you for listening to the 2024 Locked on NBA season preview with the middle of the West. If you want to hear how the rest of the NBA will play out this year, subscribe to the Locked on NBA podcast network, wherever you get your podcasts and your team every day. As always, thank you.